you ready Perfect. to go? Yes, ready to go, Gip. And thank you very much for being tonight. We're really excited of having Gip over here. And we're really excited to bring you over here at Curios. Curios, for those that are not that familiarized with us, is a company that provides corporate training, improved management growth, and data analytics for Latin American companies. And Gip, maybe you can help me with the next one. Yeah. And, and what's yeah. special about Curios is that we uh, have instructors from some of the most innovative digital companies in the world and Latin America, companies like Amazon, Rapid, Dropbox, Netflix, and, uh, uh, Shopify, Lino, Mercado Libre, and many, many others. So it's always part of our mission to bring the best possible for Latin America. Um, maybe you can give me, uh, help me with that one. And it's a pleasure today to formally present you to Gibson Vido. It's over there on the screen. He has extensive experience in product and in the tech industry. Uh, he's the former vice president of product at Netflix. He has also been the chief product officer at Czech, an educational startup that went uh, public on 2013. And from that time, uh, Gibson has been leading many workshops and also teaching extensively at Stanford and many other top uh, educational institutions around the world and also advising many companies. So, Gib, it's a pleasure to have you here tonight at Curios. Welcome and, and all yours. Thanks a lot, Carlos. Thanks for being here, folks. I'm here to talk about Netflix's 2020 product strategy. Uh, and I just want to begin early in my career. The first successful software I ever built was called Elmo's Preschool. And then I built a ton of um, other kids' software and uh, started a company called Creative Wonders and then sold it to this gentleman. Uh, this is Kevin O'Leary from The Learning Company. Some of you might recognize him. He's Mr. Wonderful um, uh, on uh, Shark Tank. Um, and, and sold that company. And then we sold the, the, the learning company to Mattel. This is a celebrated uh, acquisition for $4 billion. It was also a celebrated disaster because a year later, Mattel, spun back the learning company and all of us threw us out of the company and and took down a, a loss of 3.6 billion dollars so this is a celebrated disaster of acquisitions go and for me you know the main reflection was that i had failed to create hard to copy advantage that we almost created a fad of kids educational software and that really got me thinking about how i could do things better in the future I, I uh, interviewed with this gentleman, Reed Hastings, in 2005. Some of you may not know it, but Netflix began as a DVD by mail company, sending DVDs back and forth in, in, in the mail. And Reed only really asked me two questions. He said, hey, Gib, can you delight customers? And I said, yeah, I can. I, I, I built Elmo's preschool. And luckily, his kids had, had um, loved it. So he said, OK, check. And then the second question he asked me is, can you do consumer science? And luckily I had asked him earlier what he wanted his legacy to be, and it wasn't to build a streaming industry. His answer was to, to create a system where we could test anything. Uh, and this consumer science was about um, getting data and A-B testing everything to figure out what works with customers and doesn't, what creates both customer and shareholder value. And I sort of lied a little and said, yeah, I can, I can do that. So you know, I obviously got the job. Um, and just so you know me, I look for startups with a proof of concept that are ready to scale and then I help them to grow. So I started at Netflix in 2005 when it had about a million customers and then in 2010 when it had about 20 million customers, I went on to my next startup and that's called Check, And it's a textbook rental and homework help company uh, that I helped to grow as well. In the last bunch of years, I, um, I help lots of startups all over the world and I love talking and teaching. So tonight's talk, there's really three chapters. I'm gonna introduce some product strategy frameworks to you. And then I'm gonna pretend that I am the head of product at Netflix again. And I'm gonna share you know, what their product strategy looks like. And then I want you to reflect on that. I'm gonna do two modern day cases. And that's when we'll have a discussion. And my intent is you'll see how strategy can apply to everyday conversation, everyday discussion and debate about what you should do or not. So here's my first little chapter. We're gonna talk about the frameworks. 
And I just want to begin with my definition of strategy. Uh, this is Hamilton Helmer. He's actually an economics professor at Stanford. And he describes it very nicely. It's a route to continuing power in a significant market. This photo, I'll tell you what it, it's of in a moment, but imagine it's 400 BC and you're trying to figure out how to get precious gold and jewels and spices and tea from China back to London, probably via the Mediterranean. Uh, and a bunch of explorers to, you know, work to figure out this, this route. And this route, this, this is a photo of the Silk Road, which became a huge highway of commerce. It created lots of uh, a significant market. And it's also very hard to copy. This, this section right here is actually protected by the Great Wall of China. And that's sort of the way I think about strategy. It's this sort of, this, uh, this process of discovery you're exploring to, to figure out how to make this stuff happen. And I, the reason I focus on strategy, um, there's a lot of focus these days on agile and how you build stuff, but I'm really trying to bring more conversation back to the what you build and why. But one, it, it helps to do one of the hardest things for a product leader, which is communicate an inspired vision of the future to get everybody lined up with you. And it also blends discipline and chaos. So actually chaos is required. The, the invention of new things come out of the shadows. They come out of the unknown. And strategy provides the discipline to, to make things happen in a way that makes sense for both customers and for shareholders. Strategy helps form hypotheses to delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And I'll talk a little bit more about what I mean by that. But strategies really are hypotheses about how you'll delight in these hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And then, you know, we're all product leaders. We can, we can build anything, we just can't build everything. So imagine you have a hundred possible things that you could build. How do you decide what's mo most important? And strategy can help facilitate what are the five or 10 most important things at the top of the list? Um, is everything cool? Carlos, my screen just went kind of wonky. Sorry. No, is. everything is right over right. here. Yeah. Yeah, it's back. And then um, it helps to communicate a plan. So as companies get bigger, people start saying, hey, I don't understand how all this stuff fits together and strategy can help with that. So the three frameworks I'm gonna very briefly introduce and I'll, do, I'll go in depth on one of them. I just wanna introduce these ideas to you because you'll see them in a few minutes when I present the Netflix product strategy. So the first one, I call it the GLEE model. And that GLEE, it actually stands for, you get big on the initial thing. So as a startup, uh, Netflix tried to get big on DVDs, it did, and then it led the second thing, which is to, to lead streaming, and then it expanded worldwide. And this is a framework I use to encourage people to think big. GEM is about helping teams get aligned get product and marketing and sales aligned. It's a very simple question. How would you prioritize three things? Growth, engagement, and engagement is really a proxy for how good is the product, what's your product quality, and then monetization and making money. And then uh, the DHM model, I, I've shared the, 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 the meaning, it's about delighting and hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And the purpose of each of these three, the first glee is to help inspire long-term thinking, to provide a vision. GEM is about getting people in an organization aligned to get marketing, sales, technology, product, all on the same page for a moment in time. And then DHM is about forming hypotheses to compete in the long-term. So I just wanna go a little in depth on the DHM framework. This idea, you know, to my mind, the product leader's job is to do just that. Your job is to delight customers in hard to copy, margin enhancing ways. Margin is just a fancy way of saying make money. And make money that you can reinvest in building an even better product in the future. So I'm hoping and expecting that um, everyone is, a, is using Netflix. That, you might not be paying, but that's okay. Um, and I'm guessing that the, the stuff that, that delights you, and it took us many years of experimentation to understand this, uh, are the things on this list. Fabiola, does that, is the stuff that you love about Netflix on this list for you? I can see you smiling. Just needed to say <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then uh, the margin enhancing, this will surprise you. Um, 
you know, it took us a long while to figure out this idea of, I call it an all you can eat subscription. Uh, in the United States, Luis is paying 16 bucks a month or something for everything that, 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 that he'd like to watch. Um, and we do lots, uh, we did lots of price and plan testing. In the old days, it was $22 a month for three DVDs going back and forth. Today, there's some people that are paying $17 a month for Ultra HD and some people that are paying 10 bucks a month to just get one stream into the house at low def or on mobile only in India. Uh, and and but the, the thing that doesn't, isn't apparent to people today is, is this what I'm going to talk about. And the idea is to right size the original content investment. Today, Netflix spends about $20 billion a year on movies. They want to they want to bring all the stories in the world to you. The, the tricky part is they just got to get the level of investment right. So they have data about all of your movie tastes all over the world, nearly 200 million people today. And we discovered up front about 80% of you have watched Stranger Things. Netflix made an estimate that about 100 million people would watch Stranger Things. And because of that, they were willing to invest 500 million bucks. And that's the idea of right sizing. And then they made an estimate that about 20 million people would like Bojack Horseman. Uh, you know, I love Bo Bojack. And I, I noticed that um, Hamalet Yalan, sorry for my mispronunciation, love Bojack, but I'm with you. Um, it, it, they, they, they were willing to invest 100 million. And this is the idea of right sizing. It's a huge part of Netflix's ability to make the business work. So now what I want you to think about is what makes Netflix hard to copy? If I gave you, Luis, 500 million bucks to start a startup to compete with Netflix, what would you find hard about that? So what is all the hard to copy advantage that Netflix has today? And if you haven't used Slido with us today, I'm just, we're just looking for some words. Um, I'm just holding up my phone. I opened up my camera. You don't need a QR reader a link magically popped up and it's now asking me what makes Netflix hard to copy. So I'd love it and you can, you can um, you know, keep it as simple as possible because we're gonna be building some word clouds, but I'd really love to know what you think. And I can see it happening here. Carlos, is anything here surprising you, what you see? Uh well, content is there. It's not surprising, but it's yeah. there, which is something very powerful in your case, in, in yeah. the Netflix case. Well, data, user experience. Um, yeah. You, we're starting to see a pattern here. Original content data, user experience, more content. Yeah, yeah. I see yeah, content. Like like crazy. Yeah, one of selection okay, now, is crazy. Selection is personalization. Yeah. That's good. Yep, yep. I'm looking to see what's missing. I see the recommendations, it's all good. Uh, the data, I'm seeing it. Oh, simplicity, that's a good, that's a good debate. Um, recommendations, that's what the personalization. Well, I'm looking for two ideas that are missing. Oh, there it is, I see it. The word brand, brand. is a yep. hard to copy brand. You guys trust Netflix with your, uh, credit card each and every month. <laughs> and there's just one, oh, you know, I think it's there. I see this word omni-channel. Um, I'm, I'm looking for the idea that you can watch Netflix anytime, anywhere. But this, these are the things that all make Netflix hard to copy. So th this is the stuff I was fishing for. Is the brand is all about movie enjoyment made easy. That's what we were setting out to build a product that was true of that. Personalization is an example of unique technology. And the network effect that we achieved, every device in the world that's got a screen is now magically ready to let you watch. And I call original content, it, it comes out, it, it, I call it economy scale. Because Netflix has 200 million uh, viewers, they can afford to spend 20 billion a year. You know, I love to say this, Luis, I know you're in Seattle, poor Amazon can only spend, you know, eight, eight billion a year, right? And poor Duke, Disney and Hulu can only spend like seven, um, billion a year. Uh, and this is just, you know, what happens when you have that economy of scale. So, and, and this was a substantial learning for me over time. How do you do the things that delight customers that help build a business, but are also incredibly hard to copy? And that's really been the key in, in the second back half of my career. Um, so if you look on the left, these are all the ideas. These are all high level strategies of how we hoped 
to delight customers in hard to copy, margin enhancing ways. We experimented with all of these ideas and the stuff in green is the stuff that worked. It delighted customers, it was hard to copy, and it helped provide a, a better business. The stuff in yellow, you can see there were a bunch of things that actually made the business a little bit better, but those weren't quite as good because they didn't delight and they weren't hard to copy. And then if you look way down at the bottom, you'll notice question marks on two new ideas, interactive stories, like um, examples would be Bandersnatch. Has anybody on my panel watched Bandersnatch? You can just nod to me, Bandersnatch. I got nothing, Anna hasn't watched it. Okay, you guys, I'm giving you homework now. Um, and then, you know, experimenting with AR and VR. So this is, this is the job. All the thing on the left are these high level theories and hypotheses about how you're gonna delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. Um, you'll, at some point, um, Carlos will share a link. To, I wrote a series, it's like 12 chapters. It's 36 min minutes of reading, explaining all those tools, models, and frameworks. So that's my way of, of saying I can't talk about it all now, because I want to go on to show you what the product strategy looks like. And so now I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch into a different character. I'm gonna pretend I'm back at Netflix. It's January, the beginning of year 2020, it's pre-COVID. And I'm gonna pretend I'm at an all hands meeting. All the employees in the company, I'm just gonna talk about the Netflix strategy. So hello, hi Netflix, it's, it's cool to be back. Uh, I just wanna remind you of what we're building. So this is the positioning of the product. Netflix is a movie subscription service that delivers fast, easy entertainment in a friendly, straightforward way. And this is the brand. And we've been working doggedly for 20 years to deliver a product that delivers this idea, movie enjoyment made easy. And then the product vision, and you can see this, that Glee model at work. We, we set out to, to get big on DVD. And once we did that, we moved into an all digital. We were able to lead streaming. And once we were all digital, we could expand to the entire world. And this step function innovation has continued with original content. And we've been experimenting with what might be the next big thing five or 10 years from now. And that is interactive stories. But this is the vision of how we're hoping things will continue to play out at times. Now, if you've got a young family, uh, you might have noticed this is one of the first experiments with those interactive stories. Here was another Captain Underpants. Um, well beloved by eight year old boys. Uh, and then for the grown ups out there, many of you, uh, I, I hope that you've noticed Black Mirror Bandersnatch, which is an interactive story, or just recently we shipped uh, the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt in an interactive format where you can help Kimmy to decide if she should make out or plan the wedding. The, the product team, our high level engagement metric is monthly Attention. And this engagement metric helps us to decide if the product is better or worse. Is it more engaging or less engaging? And the way at Netflix that we've been measuring this historically is retention. When we first started the company, every month, 10% of our customers would cancel. In 2005, 5% of our members would cancel every month. And today that's down to 2%. And we keep chipping away at it you know, through those ideas where we hope to delight and hard to copy margin enhancing ways. And then that, my first couple of weeks back at Netflix, I arm wrestled with my marketing partner and my finance partner and my technology partner and asked a very simple question. How would we prioritize these three forces? Growth, engagement, which is a proxy for product quality and monetization. And the answer was we're gonna put growth first. Our goal this year is to, to grow at a 20% rate. And monetization, the way that we measure it is through lifetime value. And today that's $290 and we think we can get it better. It's slightly sad for me to see engagement third, but that 2% cancellation rate is great. Um, but we will continue to chip away at it. But we're just choosing this year to put growth and monetization first. And then I call this the, the SMT lockup, the strategy metric tactic lockup. But on the left, I'm sharing four of the high level strategies for Netflix today. We've got three or four others, but the key thing is to understand the, what's going on here. So if you look at the strategy of watching experience, the theory is that a better and better watching experience 
will make the service better. And our proxy metric for this, because retention is so hard to move and, and, and to measure, it's just, you know, we've slowly gone from 10% to 2% canceling over 20 years. We have proxy metrics. These are a little bit more sensitive. And our proxy metric is the percentage of customers who watch at least 40 hours a month. And today that's at about 60%. 60% of customers watch at least 40 hours in a month. And if we can drive that up to 70% through this better watching experience, the hope is we'll improve retention. And then over on the right are tactics and projects. You can see ultra high definition, custom playback speed, Netflix party, uh, better lip sync algorithms so we can translate into 40 languages nearly instantly. So these are some of the ideas about how to improve the watching experience. So for all these strategies, we have a proxy metric that helps us measure, is that strategy working or not? And then we have these tactics or projects. And of course, this is a, a rolling four quarter roadmap. Notice I start with Q4, uh, you know, we, we update this at each and every quarter, but you can see custom playback speed in Q4. The question is, should we roll it out or not? Uh, we'll be talking about that. And then for the watching experience, we hope to have this Netflix party ready to roll in Q1. But the point here is you can see each of those four high level theories and hypotheses on the left, and then you can see the projects and how they might play out over time. I call this the, 20, the 2020 rolling roadmap. And with that, I say thank you, and I'm gonna hop out of character, and now I'm just gonna be back to being Gib. Um, and what I'd like to do is share how strategy can impact a company's day-to-day decision-making about what to do or not to do. And I have two modern day juicy cases for you. And if anybody's been to business school or law school, these cases, you know, I'll give just a little bit of information. So I just want folks to know that it's okay to ask questions, but I want folks in, and today, everybody on the panel and Natalia and Fabiola and Daniel and Anna, I want them to feel free to ask questions, but I'd like each of them to form an opinion and maybe we'll get a little bit of debate going. And, and for uh, everyone else, we're going to be sliding. So I want you thinking, you know, if you were the head of product at Netflix today, what would you choose to do? And, and we already did a provisional decision making on each of these cases. And I, I want to see if we give you more data, more information, if your minds change or not. So the story of Netflix Party, this actually exists already. Uh, it's a Chrome extension. If you go over to Patreon, there's eight bright engineers who have created this idea. And Tom Willer is the, the product manager at Netflix in this area, and he like noticed it. He said, hmm, oh, that's interesting. You know, should, during a period of COVID, should we let folks watch Stranger Things and chat and talk and discuss the movie at the same time, especially during COVID when people are, you know, tired of their biological units and their workmates. Uh, so this is the idea. It's a little proof of concept. And the way it works is you, you install this Chrome extension, you open up a video and then you create your party and then you can make it easy for everybody to join and watch and discuss and chat and heckle all at the same time. So that's the idea. And just to be clear, that's a, almost a proof of concept by a bunch of engineers outside of Netflix, but Tom's thinking, huh, what if we did it for real? You know, it made, you don't have to download the Chrome extension, why don't we just build it into the Netflix product? And that's, that's what this case is about. So I just wanna give you a little bit more data. I just wanna point out that Netflix has killed a bunch of stuff that's quite social. So um, from 2005 to 2009, we tried to do a social feature. It was called Friends. And we connected you with your friends. And the idea was your friends would give you great movie ideas. Um, and you would stay with the service because you didn't want to leave your friends. It would help build retention. And unfortunately, only about 5% of the members really engaged in that. Um, and Netflix is good about stuff. If, if it doesn't get to like 20% of its members, you don't have a shot at actually improving retention. So they killed it. You know, we would call it scraping the barnacles. We'd get rid of all the old stuff. And then we were, we were out on the Xbox and we had something called party mode. And same thing, same result. You could talk, you could heckle, um, but we chose to kill it because only about 5% of members engaged. And then in 2010, when Netflix was extending into lots of different countries, they had a feature called Tell a Friend. And if you were a Netflix member, you could tell a friend, hey, this movie's cool. You know, I think that you'll watch, you'll love watching Bandersnatch. 
Um, and if they weren't a member, it would sort of magically get to them via email or chat or WhatsApp or whatever applications existed. Um, and they killed this feature too, because clearly it didn't get used enough. So I just want to give you two insights about Netflix social. The first is your friends have really sucky movie taste. Okay, this is true, right, Anna? I saw you smiling, okay? This is true. And then the second is you have many, many, many guilty pleasures. You don't really want everybody to know what you were watching like last night, right? Uh, Danielle, how was Cake Boss last night? Did you enjoy it? Wait, how was what again? Cake Boss. Cake Boss? No, Do you have any guilty pleasures? I have no idea. <laughs> never guilty seen pleasure it. is a movie you're sort of embarrassed that you watched, but you did, and you don't want your friends to know about it, okay? So that was the insight. So now the question today, it, I have a little bit more data. This little Chrome extension has grown from 500,000 to a million people using it in the last 60 days. That's really super impressive. And if you go over to the Google Play Store, you'll notice there are now 10 million downloads of this Chrome extension. I mean, this is some interesting data. Netflix hasn't done anything. And Tom's looking at this and saying, hey, this is an interesting proof of concept. And then the engineers are kind of excited about this. They're saying, hey, we can launch this party for everybody's laptops next month, and we can extend it to all platforms, everybody, all the places that people are watching. Because of the structure of our app application programming interfaces, this is easy for us to execute, but it's also very hard for our competitors to copy. And so the question I'm going to put to you all is, if you were the product leader at Netflix, would you roll this out? Do you think this has the potential to delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? And if I recall, 95% of the audience was saying, yes, we should do this. Okay, Danielle, um, tell me what you think about this idea. So I think it sounds great. Um, but mainly on paper, I'm going to say, because it's really hard to get people, you know, to agree on one thing to watch, at what time, how many people are going to join. Interesting. So it sounds great, but you, do, do you think this feels consistent with this brand of movie enjoyment made easy? Does it sound easy to you, Daniel? No, no, to me, it sounds the opposite. Okay. Well, now I know 95% of the folks say yes. So, um... Camilla, you, you thought this was a great idea, right? Yes, uh, I like more. to watch Tell movies. Tell me why you, you're so excited about this idea. Let me know. Um, now, due to the COVID, I can see my friends. So I think it's a great idea to spend time with them watching a movie online and sharing comments too. So I like the, I like the idea. That sounds awesome. Uh, Natalia, what do you think of this idea? Um, so at first, I thought it was a great idea, but then I thought how complicated it is sometimes to coordinate with my friends to do a Zoom meeting. So watching a movie might be more difficult. Oh, you're saying Daniel influenced your thinking, didn't he? Ah, yeah, in a way. And then I was trying to answer if it was a margin enhancing uh, alternative as a product manager. So um, maybe I wouldn't, to be honest. That's cool. I'm seeing that Cesar's son's school is using Netflix Party, which is cool. Fabiola, where do you end up on this one? Actually, I said no, but it's because with what nowadays, with so many video calls, um, you want to stay away from things that look like calls or meetings or just deal with more people on the screen. <laughs> and just for that, and I'm like, I will say that no. But just because of that. Yeah, and so to answer your question, great question from Vanessa Rodriguez. Um, you can have as many Netflix parties as you want. Remember, Netflix is all about value. It's unlimited, right? So if you're a subscriber, you can you can have all the Netflix parties you want. There's no limit to this. Luis, where 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 do you stand on this idea? So I think it could be uh, interesting for certain users. Uh, I agree with Fabiola. Uh, about that uh, many people are really stressed out watching PTLs the, the whole day. But uh, I would say that maybe some users would be interested. For example, in my case, I have uh, family far away and 
uh, or friends who live very far away. So this could be an opportunity to gather. Uh, if maybe Netflix recommends something interesting, I could I could take it. So maybe it could work. Well, let's see. Uh, I, let's I see would be we, I, I would be open to try it. Yeah. Let's see if this discussion has influenced thinking out there. If I recall, like ninety four percent said yes before. And I'm just curious if this discussion, I've given you more data as well. I've given you more context. I've given you, you know, a little bit how to think about, will this delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? And one of the ways to think about this is if you could get something like 20% of your members engaged in it, now you've got a real shot at actually improving retention. And during COVID, might that happen? Luke, uh, Danielle's still saying no, right? Like, he's, this is crazy. And then uh, Cam Camilla, I guess one of the questions is, you know, post COVID, you know, will this be used? So we've influenced a few folks out there in this thinking. So I'm just gonna tell you uh, what Netflix chose to do. Uh, they chose not to launch. And, and some of the ideas came out in the discussion already. The first, we're not normal people. Okay. I mean, all of us are gathered together using Google Slides and Slido and Zoom uh, on a Thursday night. Okay. We, we, we're all freaks. Like when I was doing work at Netflix, uh, I would always require that we go talk to customers, you know, very far away from Silicon Valley. I would describe us as Silicon Valley freaks, but I'm sure that you guys are Lima freaks. Okay. Um, and just to notice that sometimes our instinct isn't perfect. You need to go talk to normal people. And then, if you're trying to create this simple service, you have to say no to a lot of stuff. Like if Netflix said yes to a bunch of stuff, all of a sudden the interface would be complicated. I, I saw some great comments from um, Gustavo, like how the heck do you choose, you know, who's in the party? This is complicated stuff. And then, you know, my guess is yet again, you'd only see 5% of the membership engaging in this. And if you can't get enough delight, then there's no hard to copy advantage and, and you can't improve margin. The only way you can improve margin, there's actually two ways. Um, if this was a, a work, something that drove a lot of word of mouth, people were talking about it and more people were signing up because of it, or you got 20% engaged, that would improve retention. And then um, in, it, it sort of Danielle kind of got to it, which is this is not actually that easy. I mean, so the reason that Netflix lets you watch multiple streams is in our household, we have four simultaneous streams. So Kristen and I can watch in, in our bedroom and then Britt can watch in the, the dining room and Kelsey's watching in her bedroom. Because it's really, really hard to get everybody to agree on the same movie and then to watch at the same time. Okay, so I wanna give you a second case. And this is that, that custom playback speed. So the context for this is for mobile devices, what if, and uh, earlier, I think it was Natalia. Natalia's watching a lot of YouTube stuff fast, right? What percent faster do you go, Natalia? What's the number? 1.5, usually. Yeah, really fast. So the context here is you can speed it up or slow it down, right? And the consumer insight, the, the place that this came from, was it's a very frequent customer request. And it's really because of what Natalia said. Um, YouTube and podcasts, people are used to doing this. On a podcast, I've done it, you know, I, I only go like 110%. Uh, my daughter goes 150% faster for her med school videos. Um, and then my question here, I'll start slowly. This is something that Netflix could and probably would test. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you what happened. Netflix is very interested in this and chose to test it on mobile devices, but they were nervous about a very important issue. And I'll let you guess at what that is. And panelists, I want you thinking. Um, they, they rolled it out in New Zealand on mobile devices only. And what's the biggest concern? Uh, can you guess, uh, Luis, what people were afraid of or Anna? What's the big concern here? Uh, who, who might not like this idea? Well, uh, I would say maybe some people would uh, would just watch a movie or a series, maybe a series too fast, and they won't have any content to watch later. Not on. a problem. Not a problem. Yeah. Netflix won't run out. Okay. Yeah. Who else might be kind of upset with this idea? Do you have any guesses, Anna? 
Um, maybe like serious movie fans. So yes, like, you're getting you're closer. Out, like, you yep. miss out on details. You know, the serious movie fans are like, this is art. You can't, you can't manipulate art. So who, who's the person that's going to be most upset about people slowing down or speeding up their art? Who's going to care the most? Um, the directors, producers. Yeah, the directors, the producers, the, the, the studios, right? They're, they're going to be pissed. Well, Netflix rolled this out in a small audience. And guess what? The studios noticed, okay? Luis, you want to do a, um, a dramatic reading of this quote for us? Sure. Netflix don't make me call every director and show creator on earth to fight you. I will win. They're pissed, right? Carlos, you ready? How about this one? There is no way Netflix will move forward with this. That would mean they are taking control of others' art and destroying it. Yeah, and that's the dude from Breaking Bad. So these folks, the studios are pissed, right? So you got to test. How do you decide what metrics might you look at to decide if this is a good or a bad idea? And what you're really trying to measure is, is this useful to customers? So how would you decide? So you got a bunch of data. You've got folks out on A-B tests in New Zealand on their mobile devices. Can you guys give me any ideas about potential proxy metrics to decide if this is useful to customers? Got any ideas for me, Natalia? Well, I think one of the metrics is the time the uh, customers spend in watching Netflix. So this will probably decrease that metric. Okay, well, that's great. So one, it's, it, this is about improving the movie watching experience. And if you get more hours watched because of this feature, then you're doing a good job, okay? So my next question is, what, can you give me something a little bit more specific, easier to measure, to, to let you know if, if they actually like this feature? You got yeah, something maybe, for me? Go ahead. Yeah, give maybe a, a, a leading metric would be like the number or the percentage of users that are actually speeding up. The, the, the there you go, that's perfect. So um, Carlos is suggesting if we look at the data and we notice that, let's say 25% of our members use this feature at least twice a month, now we know it's useful, okay? And guess what? The, uh, the data arrived at about that. Every month, 25% of the members in this test cell were using this feature at least twice a month. Sometimes they were speeding it up, sometimes they were slowing it down. Imagine if it's in a, in a foreign language. But this is magical. Um, and so the question is, will this delight in hard to copy? Now think about the hard to copy thing. Think about the magic of technology that's speeding the, the visuals up, but it doesn't make the lip sync look funny and it doesn't make people talk in squeaky voices. It's like it makes the, the bomb scenes go a little bit faster, okay? This is magic stuff. And then if you get 25% of your members engaged in it, you got a shot at actually improving retention, which is a great way to improve your margin. Now, on the other hand, we got studios that are pissed at this idea. And you rely on studios. This is the, you know, all of your original content is coming from them. You're spending $20 billion a year with the storytellers and they're pissed because you are ruining their art. So now I want to see, um, that was great uh, articulation, Gustavo. I saw your, your chat. Um, so before, if I recall, it was like 60% yes and 40% no. And it looks like a lot of people are saying no now. What do you see here, um, Anna? Does this surprise you in any way? No, um, I'm guessing everyone's scared, <laughs> of, scared the of the studios. Yeah, that's an interesting problem, right? So when we've revealed more data, we've actually showed that the customers like this, um, the, the revealing of what do the studios say has caused a lot more people to say no. Danielle, which way did you go this time? I said yes on this one. 
You said yes on this one. Mr. No, Daniel, now says yes. That's amazing. Fabiola, where are you on this? Yeah, I said yes as well. Okay, Carlos, where are you? Where are you? Uh, in my case, in no. Okay, Carlos says no. Mariela, where'd you go? I would say yes, because Netflix is for the users, not the producers. Oh, that's a very nice articulation, Mariela. Okay. So what did Netflix do? They, they chose to, to, to launch. And uh, Mariella hit it. Um, this was all about the customer. So here's what I, I'm hoping that you learn from this. This is, for me, this is about customer obsession. You know, how can you delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? And the question is, how do you delight customers? Not, will you piss off the studios? In this case, if you get 25% of your members engaged, you got a shot at actually improving retention. And over the years, you know, Netflix's hope is to get from 2% cancel every month to only 1.9%. You just chip away with these different ideas. And then the interesting thing about this, um, in the room, we've had a bunch of product leaders at Netflix, the content team didn't engage in this discussion. This is the product leader's job to figure out whether they should do it or not. The content team that's spending the 20 billion isn't part of this conversation or, or debate. They're maniacally focused on getting the right content while the product team is maniacally focused on building a better product and experience. And then Netflix, they call this tightly aligned, loosely coupled. The whole organization understands the high level strategy, but, the, but there's only loose coupling, which is to say a content team doesn't weigh in on decisions about product. And the product team doesn't say yes or no to whether somebody should sign, you know, this next studio for, for a movie. Um, each has got a separate job. And this makes the decision making a lot faster. And then um, this is about creative destruction. Remember, uh, in the early days, you'd have black and white movies. And then the, the, the creators were a gas that they would add, add sound. And then they added color. And then they did movies with talkies. And then Pixar came along and started doing 3D animated art, you know, ruined, you know, the, the, the previous uh, cell structure that Disney had. Um, and so this is just the history of storytelling uh, and tools and technology will, you know, change and, you know, I think make better. And this is this pattern of creative destruction. So at the end of the day, you know, Netflix chose not to worry about what the studios think. All right, so I wanna bring things home and then we'll have some time for, for questions. Um, strategy for me is this exploration, this discovery. I've got this woman that's going out to sea to discover the path uh, to, you know, to, towards inventing this future. You know, obviously Netflix has done a great job of inventing the future of streaming. And I just want you to think about strategy as this route to continuing power in a significant market. And these strategies, strategies are hypotheses about how you will delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways. Remember that big list that I shared, you know, about half the ideas worked and half didn't work. Strategies are these hypotheses. And I shared just three of the frameworks today, but they enable you to combine the discipline and the chaos. To discipline your thinking with the Glee model, how we're gonna get big, what, where will we lead and how we expand further but to also embrace the chaos, because chaos is where invention comes from. It comes from the unknown. And, and at the end of the day, strategy is about communicating an inspired vision of the future. And that is your job. So I'm gonna leave you with a juicy quote. If you wanna build a ship, don't drum up the people to gather wood, divide the work and give orders. Teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. And that's what we as product leaders should endeavor to do for, for everybody who works for us to, to help invent the future, to change the world. This is from Antoine de Saint Exupéry from Le Petit Prince. There's my bad high school French at work. Uh, so with this, I wanna say thank you. If you know me, um, I do lots of talks and this is that awkward moment where sometimes I feel like a street performer, like I'm doing my best to breathe fire and you've got the crowd there. And then the street former does this really stupid thing which is they passed the hat. And this is the moment I'm passing the hat, but I promise you I'm not asking for money. I would just love your feedback. And I, I try to make it easy, which is this is a QR code. If you hold up your 
your phone as though you're, and Carlos is dropping a link in the chat right now, which is awesome. Yep. A link will pop up and this is a scale where zero is bad and 10 is great. You can choose any number on how likely you would to be to recommend this talk to a friend or a colleague. So zero sucks, 10 is great, choose whatever number. And then it's also asking you two more questions. One, what was one thing that was good about this talk? And the other question is, when, what's one thing that would make it better? This is my 589th survey result from talks. Since uh, my lockdown in March 12th, I've done, this is probably my 80th talk. So I just wanna thank you in advance that this is my, my consumer science. Um, this is how I've learned to do what I do. So thank you in advance for your feedback. It's just incredibly helpful to me. Um, this is the same QR code. So if you haven't done it yet, you can, you can take a shot at it. And Carlos has shared a link. Um, I've created one page with a PDF of this presentation for the link for the survey. And then I, I put a link for the series that I wrote about how to define your product strategy. Uh, it's a 12 part series. Nothing bad will happen if you visit my site. There's a link at the top of the page there. Um, I don't do advertising. I don't require emails. It's just there waiting for you. Uh, and with that, I'll say thank you. Um, Danielle, this is my guilty pleasure, okay? Tiger King. So I've been watching it. You should check it out too, and you'll see why I should be a little bit embarrassed about it. Um, and I just want to uh, just nicely remind you, uh, thanks so much, Curios team, for having me. Um, if, if you happen to use the Curio the QR code. Yeah, for this. yeah, yeah. yeah. Th thank you very much, Gib, for information. Really valuable. Um, presentation was amazing. Um, for all of you guys over here right now who want to receive more valuable content and benefits or information about Curios, please mm -hmm. join us in our, our WhatsApp group. You can scan this QR code, another QR code of the session, and you will receive also a link and to the same WhatsApp group in case you want to join us. Um, Thank you, Gib. Um, remember, Curios is a company that provides corporate training in pro growth and data analytics for Latin American companies. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here, Gib. Amazing uh, presentation, as I mentioned before. So with that, uh, it's my time to remind you to stop sharing so we can be, be on the screen. And hey, how about those panelists? Look. Thank you, Danielle and Fabiola and Anna and Luis yeah. and Camilla, Mariela, Natalia. Mariana, uh, thanks a lot for participating. And, and I can see all your chat stuff. So thanks a ton, Diego, um, Buendia, and uh, you guys have to translate. Uh, thanks a ton uh, for your thanks, Caesar. Uh, the best thing you can give me is to, to fill out the, the survey. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, let's see, yep. Carlos, can you see the Slido stuff? Yes, of course. So there is one that is highly prioritized here is, and the question says, what are the two most important research methodologies that Netflix uses to identify people's insights in order to develop series or movies for them? That's the question. Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, whenever you talk about research, um, uh, you know, I'll call it consumer science. There's always four sources, which is, there's qualitative, you can talk to people in focus groups for usability. There is surveys, you can ask them what they think. There is existing data and then there's A-B testing. So I'm always using those four sources. They all have pros and cons. Um, I think the question was specifically about Netflix making a decision on what movie or TV series to fund. Um, I'll say it's about 80% art and 20% science, okay? So recognize that Netflix has a ton of data about people's movie tastes. So when the company made the decision to fund its first original content, $100 million in House of Cards, they knew the extent to which Netflix members enjoyed Kevin Spacey, for instance, and they also know the extent to which Netflix members enjoyed The West Wing. Okay, so that's sort of the 20%, uh, you know, I think this is gonna work for us. And then the 80% art, uh, and this is what the team in, in um, Hollywood does, it's still early days. So um, they're, they're not too data driven and they never engage in telling the storyteller what to do when they're creating it. The, the, most of the data is just trying to answer that first question, 
should we spend a hundred million dollars on the West Wing at Red or, uh, um, or back to my earlier, should we spend a hundred million on BoJack or 500 million on Stranger Things? And that's where some of the data is helpful. That's a great thank question. Thank you, Carlos. Okay, okay. Thank you, Gib. So the next question is, how does Netflix differentiate from Amazon Prime? Yeah, there's a bunch of differences. Um, so recognize Amazon Prime is a value add to the overall Amazon service. And another thing is when you think about uh, all these choices out there, it's not a winner takes all. Um, so Netflix, you know, it's just been trying to, I mean, what they do is what their game is, is deliver a ton of value to you, use their economy of scale to keep, keep delivering more and more original content, more than anybody on the plate, place of the earth, make it wicked easy for you to find stuff that you'll enjoy through its personalized merchandising. And then experiment, you know, to figure out what the next big thing five to 10 years out, and that might be interactive stories. Um, and so, you know, the short answer on Amazon Prime is Netflix has a bigger selection. Um, and, and and they would say they, they, they won 160 Emmys this year for their television series, where poor Amazon only won, uh, rather, uh, 160 nominations against Amazon's sort of 40 nominations. I think this year, uh, Netflix won 27 Emmys for their television. And actually, it a little surprise me, HBO was first at 32, but I think Amazon only had a handful. Anyways, better content. Great, great, great. And um, there's another question here, Gib. How much uh, has machine learning helped engagement in terms of cost benefit? Was it worth it? Yeah, so I'm no, I'm no longer in Netflix, so I don't really know exactly, but the machine learning, is, I'm, I'm confident, is, has been a, a big part of Netflix's personalization efforts. I can't remember, was, I can't, it was, maybe it was uh, Natalia or Camelia. I, I asked uh, how could the service be better, and they said, I wish it was easier for me to find movies that I love. And Netflix is always trying to do that. So for perspective, you know, 2005, you would look at 100 things before you chose one thing. And today, you look at 40 things before you choose one thing. The dream in Netflix is 10 years from now, you'll show up, there's only one thing to watch, and it's playing right away. Um, <laughs> that, that the service will know exactly what you want to watch at that moment in time, what mood you're in, etc. cetera. Um, machine learning uh, has been incredibly helpful as Netflix. There's probably three or 400 algorithms and tests at any moment in time, testing these different personalization algorithms. Uh, so I'm sure it's been super helpful. Uh, does it make the business better? Yes. It's one of the areas that's been proven to actually improve retention. Uh, and okay. retention makes the business work. Great, great. And Give there is another question here. What was the rationale behind getting rid of the star rating in Netflix? What is about engagement or monetization? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's yep. an awesome question. Yep. Um, okay, so in the old days, Netflix, we collected like 10 billion star ratings. They were all five-star system. And then this little company in California called Facebook expanded the whole world and they came along with a simple gesture, a thumbs up or thumbs down. And so the short answer is, circa 2012, Netflix tested the five-star system against the thumbs up and thumbs down. And this simpler gesture got twice as much taste input about your taste. Um, so that's part of the answer. It was A-B tested and it was clear and obvious that this was a simpler way. The other answer, um, during the, that time period, the world changed in the DVD era with five-star ratings. Um, you know, it was a considered decision. What movie do I want sent to my home? In the streaming area, if you, if you start watching a movie and a minute in, you don't like it, you just quit, okay? Well, Netflix has a lot more implicit data today. So it doesn't need to ask you a lot what you liked or didn't because it's seeing what you watch and don't watch. If you start watching uh, Cake Boss, Danielle, you have to watch it now. 
and quit two minutes in, you know, Netflix has learned that you don't like Cake, cake Boss. And then if tonight you, you try um, Tiger King and watch it for three hours, it knows. That's a really strong implicit signal. Um, anyway, so there's really two reasons that Netflix went from the five-star system to the up and down. It's a great question. Great. Um, there's another question here that says, in a business where content is the cornerstone, is the product still being a strategic component? That's a great question. <laughs> no, I'll go back even further. Uh, the main insight that I provided in the early days in DVD by mail company, 2005, 2006, 2007, was if we can figure out how to get to the, the disc in the mail the next day to a person's house, that would improve retention. And that was true. It had nothing to do with the website. And so my partner, Tom Dillon, he was in charge of these DVD by mail systems. He said, like, why do we need you, Gib? And I'm like, you wait. A few years from now, we won't need DVDs by mail, and it'll be streaming only, which was true, right? Um, to answer your question, um, you know, we just, we've already brought up a couple of things. So yes, the content is really important. Um, but at the end of the day, you want an experience that's simple and easy. You want a system that magically helps you define what you want to watch right now or not. That's the personalization. Um, you want to, to pay as little as possible for as much value as possible. That's essentially a, a price A-B testing issue. You want tons of original content. Well, the product team provides help in deciding how much to invest in those things. Um, you want it available on every device around the world. The product team is enabling that. And then there's wild new questions like uh, in India, uh, India is the place where that enabled the download and playback later because people had great internet at their work and lousy internet at home. So they would download at home and then watch it later and they came back. In India for the first time, there's mobile only plans that are only like $4 a month, okay? Anyways, I'm making my case for, for why product is still important in a business, in a company where original content is so important. I'll give you one other. The experimentation with the interactive stories. Just imagine, I'm sure that's driven by, um, by the product team. We'll see how it works <laughs> out. We'll know five or 10 years from now. Yeah, great. So there is another question related to disruption. What, will Netflix jump to traditional movie releases and destroy movie theaters? What do you think about that, Gip? Well, I don't know about you guys, but movie theaters are in horrible shape right now, okay? I mean, in the world. Um, yeah, I mean, there's one little gotcha. It turned out that you couldn't be a candidate to win an Oscar if your movie was never released in a in a in a movie theater. So sometimes people speculated that Netflix would create a movie theater or chain a movie theater so that they could make sure all of their content was eligible to win an Oscar. Um, you know, I'm very biased here. I feel like movie theaters have done a lousy job of creating better and better experiences for us. Like, 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 I go to a movie theater like 30 minutes early just to get a good seat. And then I'm forced to watch these previews, okay? It's just a bad experience. So now think about what some folks are doing in their house. I mean, they've got TVs that are eight feet wide and they've got ultra HD and amazing sound and they can watch whatever they want whenever they want. I just feel like, you know, the, the it's a horrible thing to say, but I feel like the movie theaters, you know, they, they, they haven't worked hard enough. Um, anyways, I don't think Netflix would invest in movie theaters because they're all about building bridges to the future and not to the past. Cool, cool. Um, Gib, I have one personal question of my own. What uh, competences, for example, would you look in for new hires for a product manager role? What, what are the things that you, that, that, that you are looking for? Yeah, I'll tell you. Um, the technical skills of a product leader or a product manager, the first one is technical. So, but, but I actually grew up as an English major. So it's just, 
don't let your eyes, eyes gloss over when your technology partner starts talking techie uh, management. So the ability to get a team of artists and designers and data science folks and engineers to work together, creative skills. You know, creativity is the lifeblood of what we do. I actually think positioning and marketing skills, how can you describe a product in a compelling way is super important. Um, mm -hmm. Design, uh, you know, everything that we do got harder when you were forced to do it on these tiny little devices. It really forced you to keep it simple. And then the sixth is, I call it consumer science, but your ability to get insight and empathize with the customer through those four data sources. To, to decide what to do or not to do. And those four data sources were qualitative and usability, existing data, surveys, asking people what they think. And then the fourth, and this is the big dog in the last 10 or 15 years, is A-B testing. Let's create this experience where you can actually do faster custom playback speed on mobile for this subset of customers and, and not give it to the control group. And we'll see if this actually changes people's behavior. Anyways. Those are six key skills. I, I've written articles on Medium. Um, I wrote one, Hacking Your Product Leader Career. It lays out those six skills and then the six skills as a, as a leader as you grow up. I wrote another article called What Your Next Head of Product Looks Like. Uh, it was for CEOs, but then all the product leaders in the world wanted to know what they needed to look like to be hired as a, a VP of product. That was kind of fun. Anyways, uh, there's a bunch of stuff. Uh, that you can read on Medium that I, I, I think will is helpful. You'll notice at the end of every one of my articles, I, I do a survey monkey link. So my NPS, my net promoter score for the hacking your career article is like 86, which is huge. I mean, 50 Whoa. is considered mm -hmm. good or very good and 70 <laughs> is considered world class. So to have something that's 86, that's called hacking your product leader career, just means it was super helpful to lots of people. And that's really all I'm trying to do these days is be helpful to product leaders all over the world in a leveraged way. Okay, okay. Thank you, Gib. So maybe we can take a couple more of questions and then we can make it a night. Um, one of the questions that we have here is, um, so you know, in, in Latin America, you have uh, tech companies like in the US. Uh, also, you have many legacy companies, old age legacy companies that are doing a massive digital transformation process, no? Uh, they are starting to work in a more agile way um, doing more digital products. It's like a blockbuster trying to become Netflix. Think about that. And, but something that we have seen that is missing in that companies when they are transforming is the role of the CPO. So they are doing several efforts uh, scattered around the company, but there is no one CPO. So I just wanted to ask you the question, how important is the role of the CPO? Uh, what, what, uh, and, and what does he do in, 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 in a TLDR way, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, so it, you know, I can say chief product officer or VP of product. It kind of depends. I mean, in the States, the, I noticed that the product leaders, the CPO in New York City, for instance, are more business oriented. Um, okay. In Silicon Valley, the, the chief product officers, they, they do a nice job of blending, you know, delight, customer value with the business, okay? So there's different styles all over the world. Um, gosh, how do you help companies make that digital transformation? There's so many things. Um, here's the problem. Like becoming an innovative company is really about three pretty big things. One is the culture uh, of the company, that the values, the skills and behaviors that they believe are important. And frankly, um, it's like feeling comfortable to questioning and challenging everything, being iconoclast, being a, a pain in the butt 14 or 15 year old that's challenging everything, okay? That's culture. And culture is great because it creates high judgment individuals. Um, and then you have the consumer science. That's all the A-B testing. That's the data. And then you have strategy. So you're trying to get those three forces lined up. Strategy, culture, and consumer science to align the three. And that's, we've actually been talking about that. 
Hmm. And for me, that's the job of the chief product officer. And it's freaking hard. Okay. It really is hard. Um, so, it, you know, these change, like my coaching to help companies change is start with one small team that becomes the role model team. Because nobody likes to be told what to do. And then start pointing at that role model team. Look what these guys are doing. And, and then, the other, you know, inspire the other folks to start copying some of the skills and behaviors. That's been one of the more effective tactics that I've found for achieving change. I mean, the other one is keep it simple. Just say, these are the two or three things that I'm trying to make happen this year, not eight or 10 or 15 or 18, okay? That's how change happens. And then when you have a success or a win, celebrate it. Oh, look what these guys did. That's amazing. No, that's yeah, the yeah. Okay. Great. And last question of the night, Give. Um, what is the relationship between product and growth? Uh, how was in that case, in, in the case of Netflix, do you have separate teams? They were all uh, in one team. Is the same thing uh, in reality? What do you think about that? Yeah, I'll just tell you how I did it. At Netflix, I did the same way at Chag. And frankly, I've done the same way at like, other startups I work with. So the tricky part is you have product and then you have marketing, okay? And marketing is defining the positioning and the brand, what the product wants to be when it grows up. And, and product's trying to make, deliver a product that embodies those ideas. So the hardest part at Netflix was we had something called the non-member page. And that's the page you go to if you're not a member and it says, click here to start your one month free trial, okay? And that page is super important to the product team. They're spending $200 million a year to get people to go to that page, right? Um, so this is the challenge. I got the people who can build the product and build those pages really well, and then the people who care about it. And so I just experimented. So for a long while, I actually trained all the marketing people on how to build that technology themselves, okay? And I, I was just helping them, coaching them. And, and that actually worked pretty well until the world got complicated. You could sign up here. You could sign up on your Apple TV. You could sign up on your PlayStation. And now it became a big technology challenge. And that's when I had to bring back that one non-member page, click here for a free trial, back into the product organization. But the key thing there is defining the roles. The marketing defines the brand and the product. Product brings it to life, okay? Um, and so we're, how did growth came? Growth came initially from how much money do you spend to build awareness and trial at $200 million. Later, it was word of mouth. Like, so think about it. Every year at Netflix, we would decide how much to spend on marketing versus product and technology versus content. And, you know, pick a year, I don't know, 2008, you had a billion dollars to spend in total. You'd spend 200 million in marketing 400 on product and 400 in content, you know? 10 years later, it would be, you know, almost the same amount as in marketing because, and a ton on product and even more on content. And these were the conversations we'd have because the brand was known 10 years later. You didn't have to spend a ton of money getting people to go to a website. Anyways, so those are the conversations that we had. Um, I've experimented with growth teams, but they tend to be in product. You know, the, the basic concept mm -hmm. is you're trying to build, you know, mechanized viral loops. Um, okay. Anyways, it, I guess, so my short answer, it depends, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> okay, like, every, uh, like everything in, in life, maybe. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank yeah. you very much, Gib. It has been a pleasure to have you here. If you want to say something else to to all the people over yeah. here, please hey, go for that. It's been great yeah. fun to be with you all. Thanks for sharing your time. Uh, Danielle, Fabiola, Mariana, Anna, Carlos, thanks a ton. Yeah. Luis. Thank you very much. Maria, Camila and Mario. So thanks so much for being with us today. Um, I saw everybody's awesome comments in the chat. So thanks for being here. Yep. Thanks for your thanks. And then yeah. all the stuff that you need, that PDF, that survey monkey leg, and the article on um, defining your product strategies all on my little baby website at www.gibsonbiddle.com. It's just there to be. Awesome. Here. Okay. Thank you very much again, Gib. Yep. Thanks Take a care. lot. Thanks, team, Thanks. for being with me tonight. It was great fun. Take care. Goodbye. Bye-bye.
Thank you so much, Kip.